Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast in partnership with The Real News Network. If you like what you see with this partnership and you'd like to see more, then please remember to hit the like and subscribe button. And most importantly, hit that bell so you're notified every time programming like this comes on The Real News. And with that out of the way, let me bring in my homie, my dog, my co-host. You may know him as the writer or one of the writers for Black Agenda Report. You may know him as a writer for Newsweek. We know him on This Is Revolution as the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the Real News audience. Peace and greetings to all of our fans and subscribers. What's going on, Jason Miles? It is always weird doing these shows because um, we also want you guys to subscribe to to our channel as well and watch what we do as well. But we always do things live. So we are constantly interacting. So it is a, it is a little strange to not have a chat, the new virtual studio audience to interact with. but slowly but surely we are getting used to our new setup over here at the real news are you excited for our guest today very much so uh we've tried to get this gentleman on the show i think we've had on uh a few of his his uh friends <laughs> that have tried to help us have been thankfully for our relationship with the real news we are able to finally get him on our guest is the Pulitzer Prize, I always get Trump saying that, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, former foreign war correspondent for the New York Times, and he is the host of one of my favorite shows on RT, On Contact. He's an activist. He's a teacher. He is the Chris Hedges. Afternoon, Chris. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for for agreeing to come on the show. We're we're really excited to have you. Um, even though we don't have our our chat audience here, that would be going crazy with with questions and comments. Um, Pascal, do you want to start it off with the first question? Absolutely, Chris. You know you've uh, been a long time uh, advocate and uh, activist on the left. I want to ask you a question about the current moment that we are in. In the wake of the fact that we saw a massive uh, online active, not excuse me, public activism during the George Floyd protests, with cities all around the country seeing a level of activism that we had not seen since the late '60s period, and with many uh, voices on the left, particularly uh, publications saying that 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 not really did not really translate into organizational movement politics involving the working class. There are some who have speculated that the age of mass politics, because of the hyper -technolo technological nature of society with social media, uh, the caliber of popular culture and cultural industry production we have, as well as the availability of very poor quality, cheap food, has satiated the American body, polit body politics so much that we may be in the age where mass politics is obsolete. Can you address that question? And do you believe there's any truth to the to the allegation that some on the left are making that mass politics has uh, gone, you know, to its wayside in the contemporary moment? Well, it hasn't. Um, but you touch on a very good point, And it's something that Sheldon Wolin raises in his book, uh, Democracy Incorporated, that access to credit, uh, and cheap consumer goods uh, form uh, the role of essentially a political and a social pacifier. Um, you're very right about that. Uh, and I asked Wolin before he died, uh, he probably was our most important contemporary political philosopher, was the mentor to Cornell West and Wendy Brown, a lot of other great thinkers. Um, if that access to cheap credit was cut off 
and if those cheap consumer goods, and we're now, what, what's inflation, 7 8%, uh, no longer became cheap, uh, and, and, and this feeds into this system of that he called inverted totalitarianism. And by that, he meant all of the structures remain the same, the Congress, the courts, the press, uh, but internally corporations have seized the levers of power. Uh, would that uh, perhaps produce uh, a more traditional form of totalitarianism? Uh, and he agreed. And then I think that's how we got a figure like Trump, uh, and uh, it, uh, all indications are, are that the Democrats are going to get shellacked in the midterms. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, waiting in the wings are uh, uh, competent fascists like Mike Pompeo or Tom Cotton or others. Uh, we were, were saved. I and mean, people use the word coup for January 6th. Uh, it's not that Trump didn't want a coup. It's, it's that he was utterly incapable of orchestrating one. You don't sit and eat Big Macs in front of a TV tweeting uh, while your supporters are storming the Capitol if you want a coup. Uh, but someone like Mike Pompeo graduated first in his class from West Point. Uh, he's really dangerous and really venal. Uh, those people would actually carry it out. And then, of course, we're getting a kind of administrative coup uh, through the uh, wrath of voting rights uh, regulations that are designed quite effectively to lock out the poor, people of color, you know, Democratic uh, supporters. But I think that we have to also uh, note uh, that uh, this is a, a, a moment of nascent labor activity. Uh, you've had a series of uh, strikes or union uh, organizing or attempts at organizing at Amazon, Starbucks, Uber, Lyft, John Deere, Kellogg, uh, the special metals plant in Huntington, West Virginia, owned by Berkshire Hathaway. I say that only because Warren Buffett has gotten a pass on all this stuff. Uh, the Northwest uh, Carpenters Union, Kroger, uh, teachers in Chicago, West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, Arizona. Teachers all over the country yeah, for that nurses, matter. Hundreds of nurses in Worcester, Massachusetts, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. This has all been in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, the, the pillage on the part of the uh, very rapacious ruling elite has now become so grotesque. I mean, Wall Street banks recorded record profits for 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, they milked the underwriting fees from the Fed-based borrowing. Uh, they made massive amounts of money from mergers and acquisitions. And what did they do with their profits? So this is fueled by roughly $5 trillion dollars in Fed spending since the start of the pandemic, uh, they used it for what they always use it for, which is to pay themselves massive bonuses and stock buybacks. You, you inflate the price of the stock, uh, and that increases the, 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 the money that you're uh, paid. This has been true in uh, the defense industry, pharmaceuticals, oil, gas, uh, all of which have had record profits. So we now we practice have seven, illegal at one point 745 billionaires in the U.S. who've seen their net worth grow from $2.1 trillion to $5 trillion since March of 2020. Uh, and workers are pushing back. Uh, mm -hmm. Kroger is a good example. We can go into Kroger. Um, just the people are not paid. Uh, th th this is true at Walmart. It's true at ma major corporations. I think Walmart's our largest employer. Uh, people on the average in Walmart work about 20 hours, 28 hours a week, which puts them below the poverty line. So uh, I think that mass politics are not uh, dead, uh, but I think that they're rooted in the class struggle. Uh, and the, I had great admiration, by the way, for the people who took to the streets, many with great risk, given the lethality of our militarized police in the wake of the George Floyd murder. But they didn't come with a political vision. Uh, and they weren't tied to that class consciousness, which is essential, uh, I think, for ultimately uh, pressuring and hopefully overpowering and destroying uh, the corporate state. Well, let, let me let me follow up with that same with that same uh, question about the George Floyd protests of the summer of 2020. How much of that do you think is? covid related because we were going through the lockdowns at that time and how much of that do you think is trump related because you know trump was definitely doubling down on his racist dog whistling at that time as well well, it, well i don't know if it was covid related because people were out in the streets defying 
the pandemic, and this was before the vaccine. So not only were they uh, risking uh, police uh, retribution, but they were risking the pandemic itself. Um, the the racist dog whistles by Trump. I mean, you're talking about a, a dethroned or dispossessed sense of uh, dethronement by the white working class, um, which fuels this neo-fascist cult-like uh, Republican Party gathered around Trump. Uh, I, I don't think that that was a, a, a major factor in. I think that the I think that the protests kind of petered out. You're probably better on this than I am but kind of petered out, um, uh, there, there was a kind of exhaustion within the protest movement itself. Well, the reason why I say COVID, I'm, I'm definitely talking about the lockdowns, right? We, we didn't know how long we were going to be locked down. I think most Americans probably thought it was gonna be a few months. We didn't know we'd be looking at 2022. <laughs> the numbers here in California are, are ridiculously high. Um, I think we're even hitting uh, the original lockdown numbers here in California when it comes to infection. Um, when I say uh, COVID related, I mean that frustration of being locked down. And I, and I bring that up because just across the way in St. Paul, a few years before, Philando Castile gets murdered on Facebook Live um, by police uh, for a traffic stop in front of his uh, girlfriend's child. The cop actually shot into the car, luckily missing the child. And we didn't have protests to this level. And he also wasn't, the, uh, you know, George Floyd also wasn't the only person with a high profile uh, police murder. Um, who is the young lady in Louisville? Can't think of her name right now. Who the cops did the no-knock warrant on her. That had happened right before the George Floyd as well. So I guess I'm saying, do you think it was a, a series of events that led to it? I don't think it was a Brianna Taylor. Time. Brianna Taylor. Yes. Well, it's always a series of events. It's also uh, there comes a point in which uh, these kinds of police murders uh, just uh, gather so much weight that people can't sit inside anymore and accept them. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, people were on the street, not just for George Floyd, but for. Uh, largely uh, black people in, in poor communities across the country uh, who are just gunned down with impunity. So I think there was a cumulative effect that led to the protests. I think that was all there. But you're right. It's always, there's always a variety. I mean, I covered revolutions in Eastern Europe. I covered the Civil War in El Salvador. I spent a lot of time in Gaza covering both of the two intifadas or Palestinian uprisings. It's It's always a series of forces that converge that create an uprising, uh, some of which are economic, uh, you know, it's, and, and what triggers the uprising, you're, you're also right, is not an event uh, that necessarily is unique in the sense that it didn't happen in the past, but people have just had enough. And in that moment where you have all these people mobilized, right? After you've destroyed police stations and the Arby's and the McDonald's, did the left lose an opportunity at that moment to truly organize? Well, I my sense for the these uh, protests is that they were more like flash mobs. They and social media is quite effective at creating a flash mob. That's very different from organizing, let's go back to the 60s, the March on Washington or something. It's very mm -hmm. different from organizing uh, a strike at Kroger's. We have 8,000 workers uh, now out on strike. For Kroger's is the fourth lord, largest employer in the country. It's a supermarket chain that pays its mm -hmm. under slave wages. Well, its CEO, uh, this is uh, Rodney McMillan, made over $22 million, so doubling what he made in 2018. Uh, and Kroger workers, like Walmart workers, uh, uh, are earned, their average salary is about 29000 That's about 16000 below the 45000 which is most economists would argue is needed to sustain uh, a household. Uh, it, it's different. And I think part of the problem with the left is that it's uh, too engaged in political theater it's not mm -hmm. engaged enough in political organizing. 
and it often is not literate in the most important element before us, which is class. Uh, yes, uh, racism, which is always a byproduct of the class war uh, and is used quite effectively to split the working class, that goes all the way back to the tenant farmers in the South, uh, white tenant farmers who economically were not much better off than black farmers, uh, but were fed this myth of whiteness and white superiority. Uh, I think it was Lyndon Johnson who said, you know, if you can get uh, somebody uh, to feel racially superior, uh, you can pick their pocket, which is essentially what happened and what happens. Uh, so uh, I think the, the left uh, has become captive to a kind of boutique activism about inclusiveness and multiculturalism. And I'm not against any of this identity politics. Uh, but the core of resistance in a capitalist society is, is class. It's class warfare. Unfortunately, um, we're losing big time. Well, I'd, I'd like to actually uh, pivot off that question in, in terms of your last statement. One of the themes that we have on our show, this is a Revolution Podcast, is called the 50-Year Counter-Revolution. The basic premise of that theme is that since the rise of Nixon in, in, in 68, the 50-plus year counter-revolution is that the politics that we've seen in America and in the West generally has been a counter-revolution against the New Deal civil rights coalition moving further and further in a reactionary right-wing direction bipartisanly, bipartisanly. And uh, one of the analyses that we make as a consequence of this 50-year counter-revolution is the loss of the the concept of even challenging capitalism, which revives within after the 2008 crash with the rise of Occupy, Bernie Sanders, and so on and so forth. Do you think that the contemporary manifestation of what those call the left, some would argue that we don't have a left, we only have leftists, I've made that argument, is you making some argument. of the same mistakes of the new left in the 1960s in that it is not rooting its politics in working class organization and the class makeup of this contemporary manifestation of a left is really made up of faculty lounge, <laughs> university pedigree adjacent individuals, downwardly mobile professor professorial types, who quite frankly are not really rooted in a working class politics. And can we even make that argument about the new left in the 60s in that posturing radicalism as opposed to mobilizing the working class as it was done in the 30s and 40s kind of led to its demobilization and the rise of Nixon hard hat riots, if you will. As, as I asked kind of earlier on, when you div divorce the movement from its soul, what movement do you really have left? So there's a lot there. Uh, and you raise several, I think, really important points. Uh, the left, uh, the radical left, let's call it the militants, the wobblies, the old CIO, the Communist Party, which was, uh, was very mm -hmm. important to the working class, kind of written out of American history, uh, was uh, very powerful on the eve of World War I uh, and very effectively crushed by Woodrow Wilson, uh, especially through the use of the Sedition Act and the Espionage Act. People forget that this was then used, turned immediately on the left, not on German spies. Emma Goldman was deported under it. Eugene V. Debs, the head of the Socialist Party, was imprisoned uh, under it. Uh, and then in the 30s, again, there was a, a, a real uh, class consciousness. Again, the Communist Party was very important in terms of organizing. Uh, and you're right to signal the 60s and uh, it being different. Uh, I do think the 60s were important, but I think that severance from labor uh, was uh, fatal. Uh, so you had the AFL-CIO under figures like George Meany and Lane Kirkland supporting Nixon's war in Indochina and denouncing the hippies in the street. It was largely the working class and poor kids who were fighting the war in Vietnam. They couldn't get the college deferments. They didn't have the connection. 60,000 middle class, largely white kids fled to Canada, this kind of stuff. You had figures like Bill Clinton or uh, mm -hmm. George W. Bush all got deferments, Dick Cheney, uh, you know, they had ways to get out of it. Um, and uh, now I, I was a, just a boy in the 60s, but my father was active in the anti-war movement. He was a veteran from World War II, had fought in North Africa, uh, and also in the civil rights movement. So I went to these uh, events, and it was actually in 68, our house was a way station 
where yippies could crash on the floor on the way to Chicago. Uh, so this informed uh, much of my uh, childhood. So I think that the organizing, uh, Ralph, that's when Ralph Nader uh, organized his very effective consumer movement, in fact, organized the first Earth Day, I think it was 1970. That's when you saw the rise of uh, uh, black uh, power movements, uh, the uh, American Indian movement, feminists, uh, SDS, which was the largest anti-war uh, organization in the country before uh, the Weather Underground, uh, all these figures like Bernadette Dorn destroyed it in the same way that Huey Newton ultimately destroyed uh, the Black Panther Party. Um, these were important movements and empowering movements, and they certainly frightened uh, the ruling elites, which is why in 1971 you got the famous Powell memo written by Lewis Powell, uh, mm -hmm. which was the blueprint for uh, it, it, the corporate or business interests to fight back. That's where you get the phrase from the political scientist Samuel Huntington about America's quote unquote excess of democracy. Uh, and the civil rights movement is interesting because uh, legally they, the civil rights movement achieved. Uh, integration of a black elite figures like Barack Obama, for instance, into the power structure, um, uh, but didn't address the underlying economic uh, racism that kept the poor poor, which is which King, of course, understood. Understood there would never be equal rights without uh, economic justice, and of course, he's killed in Memphis, uh, defending uh, or marching with the garbage workers who were going out on strike. Um, and uh, that essentially, that's what my friend Glenn Ford used to call the Black Miss Leadership Class. And let me just say Black Agenda Report is one of the publications I admire and read. Um, it, it, he, it was a species of colonialism. So, uh, you know, and, and the, this, this, if you look, for instance, at the Congo, you saw the rise of the great uh, revolutionary and resistance fighter Patrice Lumumba, who is then assassinated by the French and the CIA and replaced with Mobutu, who's of course black, but will do the bidding of multinationals and uh, the European colonizers. Well, we have the same kind of species of internal colonization uh, by uh, a small uh, black elite that was willing to sell out uh, and serve the interests of imperialism and capitalism, Obama, I think, being the poster child uh, for this. Uh, and, and we got caught up in this idea of identity politics. Well, you know, we have a black or biracial president, but if you have a black or biracial president who serves the interests of the war industry and ExxonMobil and Goldman Sachs uh, and oversees uh, mass surveillance of the American public and expands the drone program and uh, sides with the bankers who have just fleeced the country and trashed the global economy, then you're not, you're actually make, not making progress. I mean, uh, having Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, uh, who's a rabid right-wing member of the Federalist Society, although black doesn't, and, and I think that even to this day, if you listen to the discourse, certainly within the corporate media, the fact that Buttigieg is gay or Hillary Clinton is a woman, these are ir irrelevant. They're utterly irrelevant. Uh, but it's become a, a, a quite an effective mechanism to neutralize the left. And then I want to go to your point about who is the left. Uh, well, you're right. The vocal left is sitting around faculty lounges or thinks Twitter is real. Um, the real left is marching outside of Kruger's, uh, although some of them may be Trump supporters. Uh, uh, and that, of course, is the point that building class consciousness not only redirects uh, popular uh, power against uh, concentrated power, but it is a form of education itself. If we go back and look at the old union movements, even the mainstream movements like the AFL-CIO, education was a huge component. You read Emma Goldman's uh, autobiography, and the, these people are working for 12 hours in sweatshops in the Lower East Side, and then going to Yiddish anarchist or Marxist uh, you know, meeting groups in the evening. Uh, and all of that, you know, needs to come back. Uh, there needs but, to be a, 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 a fusion with the working class and uh, an understanding of how the system has gamed us. But would you agree that that figure, 
in the late sixties and seventies that you're describing, because I, I, we do, and we know, sorry, you're not familiar with the show. We should send you some links to the show. Sorry about that. But we make these uh, video essays for the show. So I have to go through a lot of old archival footage. And whenever I get archival footage from the thirties and forties, and I have to take like a labor movement, it's definitely a lot of people conspiring to strike, right? It's always labor conspiring to, to strike against, against management. And that figure gets replaced by the Archie Bunker type of, of blue collar. He becomes what blue collar is, right? This kind of right wing racist reactionary and his hippie daughter and her silly hippie boyfriend uh, become stand-ins for what people uh, view as the left through the, the 80s and, and of course, the, the, uh, the 90s. Um, it's interesting that you talk about uh, solidarity and class consciousness because I feel like that's a conversation that is constantly getting conflated uh, more so online than maybe in the actual organizing world because when you actually get out and organize, you do know how to talk to people. Uh, we had Luke Mayville on our show a few months back that actually uh, has been organizing in the very red state of Idaho to get some uh, progressive measures uh, passed. And one of the first questions that we had asked him was working with racists. And he definitely said, well, there's a difference between working with someone that is racist and like politically active. Like if you're a proud boy or a three percenter, you're not going to get through to that guy. But if maybe you don't have the right <laughs> words around your black and brown neighbors, maybe we can talk about some issues that we can all agree upon. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, for instance, let's look at Kroger. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you now have uh, a strike uh, by Kroger employees, 8,000 unionized employees at King uh supers uh they went on strike in colorado on january 12th uh i i'm i don't know i haven't done a survey but i'm certain that there are trump supporters in there uh, but you keep them focused on an economic injustice uh and uh and that essentially creates a kind of con class consciousness i mean that comes out of marx uh and that's right uh they suddenly begin to understand where the real configurations of power lie uh, they understand that their economic suffering is not caused by undocumented people or, or black people. Just statistically, of course, it's ridiculous. But, you know, black people or uh, brown people taking their jobs. Uh, it, there, there is in that, that organizing a kind of salutary force uh, that mitigates against the uh, caricatures that racists use. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I just want to be clear that, the, you know, we focus, the media loves to focus on the militias, which are not actually much of a threat. Um, they're easily taken care of probably by even a, a police SWAT team. The real threat uh, comes from these contractors. Uh, I don't know what Blackwater's called now, Z or something. Uh, these figures like Eric Prince. And these people are all, a lot of them are recruited from the special forces. Uh, and I've covered war for many years. Uh, special force units are death squads. Uh, and, uh, and they are closely allied with the Christian right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is one of my critiques of Antifa and the Black Bloc. That they, uh, not, not that I don't fear the rise of the fascist state, uh, but they're, they're kind of focused on the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we also have to remember that a you know a huge percentage, or us roughly usually ninety percent, of those uh, who are in combat units are white, and that's where this Christian fascism Trump lies within the military, uh, which also is very dangerous, and of course within law enforcement. Uh, so uh, even the FBI has stopped sending out profiles of local right wing extremists because they have so many ties to police agencies that that information is almost always shared with those extremists. And sometimes, of course, they're the same people. Uh, so there are some very dark forces that are coalescing around us. 
Um, but going after the Proud Boys or the three percenters or the Yahoos who stormed the Capitol misses the point. When, when things get rough uh, and uh, there, there actually is some kind of real pushback, um, the state has the ability to employ some very nefarious and dark forces. When I was at Standing Rock, for instance, the, uh, we were stopped. They were trying to block the roads. So we, we had to, took us almost a day to drive into Standing Rock. We had to drive all the way around from the north. But we would inevitably come to a checkpoint. These were guys, obviously military trained, no name tags, carrying long barreled weapons, wearing Kevlar vests, uh, who did not identify themselves. They were all private contractors. Uh, and, and that is a very frightening uh, uh, kind of reconfiguration and, of course, allied with law enforcement, but held completely unaccountable. Well, we can talk about the uh, privatization of, of the military. <laughs> that, would be, that could be a whole other show. Uh, but one thing that you did touch on, uh, and I know you write about, uh, one thing I appreciate that you write about is uh, kind of Christian fascism. <laughs> um, but I did live for a while with a white Christian conservative family. And one thing I found fascinating was that the right had totally infiltrated the churches. And one thing uh, we bring up here on this show, uh, Pascal has, <laughs> has said it many times, why doesn't the left organize in religious spaces? Why do we sacrifice these spaces to the right? Why do you think that is? And you've done extensive work in these spaces. I'm also a graduate of Harvard Divinity School, uh, and my father was a minister, and my mother went to seminary, so I grew up in the church. Uh, well, the, the problem is that the liberal, let's speak about the white mainstream church, uh, went the way of the rest of the culture. So instead of spirituality, which if you read, uh, for instance, Martin Luther King, especially at the end of his book, Strength to Love, he has this kind of ex explanation of how one stands up against radical evil and malignant injustice. That's where you are spiritually empowered. It's quite a beautiful scene that actually just thrown a bomb uh, into his house. Um, and uh, it became this how is it with me spirituality, which is just narcissism. Uh, the uh, retreat by the church. Now, the church was always fractured in the 1960s. So clergy such as my father, who were marching against the war and supporting the civil rights movement, uh, had huge opposition within the institution. I don't want to pretend that the institution itself uh, had signed on for this, but it, it kept the church uh, vital. It gave it a kind of currency. Uh, it spoke uh, in a language that uh, actually reached, especially those who were suffering from injustice. So they gave that all up. Uh, they left the city with white flight. Uh, church numbers are declining. Uh, I mean, they're just, it's in free fall because they're not socially relevant. Uh, they're just little religious clubs. Now you ask about the uh, religious right. I do not look at the Christian right as Christians. Uh, they are Christian heretics. Uh, and part of the failure of the liberal church was to call these people out for who they are. Jesus did not come uh, to make us all rich. You don't have to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School as I did to figure that one out. Uh, Jesus would not bless the dropping of iron fragmentation bombs on satanic Muslims uh, all over the Middle East. And Jesus, by the way, Jesus wasn't white. The Romans were white. Jesus was a person of color, uh, would not bless the uh, white race, and in particular the white race in America above other races. This is just heretical garbage. Uh, and it it's, uh, serves the rise of the Christian right, which is uh, bankrolled by the most retrograde forces of capitalism, Purdue, uh, Tyson Foods. Uh, there's tremendous money coming into this for a reason. Uh, it it uh, preys on the despair of largely a white working class that has been dispossessed. Uh, and I remember uh, people asked me at the start of the Trump campaign how the Christian right could align themselves with a philander and a liar and someone uh, like Trump. And I said, no, you don't understand. These mega pastors are exactly the same as Trump. <laughs> uh, the only difference is that at least this is anecdotal. The mega pastors sexual interests are probably a little kinkier than Trump's, uh, but they're the same people. And just as Trump preyed on the despair of people in his sham universities or his casino, 
these people prey on the despair of their congregations. And I, you know, I spent two years writing this book, American yes. Fascists, the Christian Right in the War in America, and spent, I interviewed hundreds of followers, sat in creationist seminars and a right to life weekends and uh, Trinity broadcasting, sat through their tapings and took an event. I mean, I was really on the inside. Uh, and and all totalitarian movements embrace a form of magical thinking. This comes from Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism, because the real world, they couldn't cope within a reality-based world. So I was in Detroit with Tim LaHaye, who wrote the End Time series for another seminar, and there's these gruesome, uh, detailed, graphic explanations, none of which is in the Bible, even the rapture is not in the Bible, uh, of what's going to happen to non-believers. You know, their blood is going to boil and the battles with the Antichrist. And uh, and I it was really then, it, it struck me that uh, this lust for apocalyptic vengeance is really a lust for a destruction of a reality-based secular world that almost destroyed them. That's why you can't argue, uh, and I think you raised this point earlier about the Proud Boys, you can't argue them out of this belief system because it's all they have left. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in fact, that there will, you will evoke tremendous hostility and anger because by attempting to dismantle that belief system, you're going to be pushing them back into the world that almost destroyed them. And I don't use that term lightly. Uh, from the many, many interviews I did, uh, these people suffered, and the suffering was real. It wasn't fictitious. Evictions, uh, struggles with uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, domestic abuse. Uh, I didn't put it in the book because it was anecdotal, but almost every woman uh, who I interviewed suffered either from domestic or sexual abuse uh, in the Christian right. I went to a pro-life a weekend in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. They asked the post abortive sisters to stand. Uh, there were about 400 women. The whole room virtually stood. But when I started going down uh, and doing interviews, uh, it turns out the women had had one abortion. They had multiple abortions, and they preyed on their guilt. In fact, there was a group called Priests for Life there, and they were running weekends where these women would go for a retreat, and they would give them dolls, and they would tell them, these are the children you murdered, and you have to name the doll and bathe the doll and uh, beg for forgiveness at the end of the weekend for the murder you committed and make a vow to spend your life fighting the forces of death. These are their words, which is us. Uh, when you get inside this movement, it's very insidious and very dangerous, and it replicates exactly what the Nazis did with the so-called German Christian church in uh, Nazi Germany, which fused the iconography, language, and symbols of the Christian religion with the Nazi party quite effectively. Uh, and so when I wrote this book and gave it the title American Fascist, there was a lot of blowback, uh, but I think I've been proved right. Uh, you look at the connecting tissue of January 6th, and it is this Christian fascism. Uh, and it has already built an infrastructure. It's already hermetically sealed tens of uh, millions of Americans within this structure. It has its own universities, Patrick Henry Law School, Liberty University. It has its own uh, systems of communication. Uh, you go into towns, as I've been there, in places like Ohio, and you can't even drive down the street uh, faster than about 15 miles an hour because of all the potholes and the boarded up storefronts, and there's one gleaming structure, and that's the megachurch that's pulling in $30,000 in donations a Sunday. So um, the, unfortunately, the neo-fascists have done what we didn't do. Uh, our, our infrastructure on the left was really built around unions. The old union hall uh, mm -hmm. was built around the uh, uh, a kind of uh, labor community. Now, we never, unfortunately, had a real labor party in this country after maybe Debs. Uh, and that, of course, is what has hurt us. You need to have a political structure allied with your union movement, uh, even at the height. I mean, S Sweden, which created in the 70s uh, the welfare state we should all aspire to, had 76 percent uh, union uh, membership. Uh, I think at the highest, we were about 34 percent or something after World War II, and now we're down to 9 percent. Um, and so we, we're almost starting from zero. We have to, and we have to, but I see, as I mentioned before, uh, these strikes and these uh, 
heroic mobilizations in Amazon and everywhere else is the, the one sign uh, of hope. Uh, we're, we're not, it doesn't lie in the ballot box. It, it lies. And in, in, in all fairness to unions, there was a bit of a racist problem here in this oh. country for a while. It wouldn't allow a large part of the workforce. Yes. In. No, without question. Yes, uh, that was, and that, of course, uh, crippled the movement. Uh, it, it, you go all the way back to the Pullman Porter strike, which Debs mm-hmm. led, uh, and many of the Pullman Porters were black, uh, but the, when they went out on strike, uh, they, they w- had not allowed the black employees to join the union. Uh, you had groups like, well, the reason black radicals like Paul Robeson and everyone else gravitated to the Communist Party is that it wasn't racist. Uh, there was an inclusive. They were against it. lynching. What's that? They were against lynching yeah, at a time when even the yeah, Socialist that, Party wasn't. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So <laughs> you're right that that racial element, but that, of course, has been, that's what goes back to what we spoke to before is how racism is always a very effective mechanism in the hands of the ruling class uh, to fracture and weaken uh, the labor movement. So yes, that's uh, very, you know, that's very true. I mean, if you look at the UAW strikes in the 1930s, there were black workers. Uh, uh, but yes, it's always been a persistent problem. And then, of course, the, the dirty deal that Franklin Roosevelt cut with uh, Democrats in the South is that uh, the the resurrection of labor and the ability to unionize would be denied to blacks in the South. They also denied, of course, the GI Bill, which is how my father went to college. Well, one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you is that uh, in terms of this working class history, which is a strong part of the left, one of the problems that I've, we've had with the contemporary moment in terms of this contemporary left that has developed in the post-occupied era is that there's been a conscious effort by uh, the those dispatched by the mainstream media, MSNBC types, certain writers, neoliberal uh, folk, uh, to paint this thing called socialism or leftism as a white thing and divorcing the whole over 100 year history of black leftism or black working class socialist politics, going back to the populist movement, the Colored Farmers Alliance, the black socialists and work and communists of the early 20th century, 30s and 40s. And making it seem like, you know, this politics is something that's just coming out of, you know, faculty lounge, uh, white kids who are, you know, downwardly mobile. And uh, we at This Is Revolution podcast were very offended by that and felt it was our job to to counteract that. As someone who is a, you know, I, you know, as I said, I write for Black and General Report and have for years and you've been a fan of that publication. What do you think about the role of the Black radical left in its ability or inability to make the reality of that black left political history known in the contemporary moment that came around during Sanders and Occupy? And do you think that perhaps an obstacle to the effectiveness of the black radical left in making that politics known to not only black working class people and black people overall, but overall mainstream America is that perhaps there was too much of a fetishization of 1972 black power thought and politics that was a bit uh, unable to be transferred into the con- contemporary moment. Um, I mean, the black radical left, uh, and, and let's go all the way back to the black prophetic tradition, which I think is the most important intellectual tradition in the United States. And I would argue uh, W.E.B. Du Bois probably is the most important intellectual in the United States, American history. Um, th- you are referring to MSNBC. I mean, these are who owns MSNBC, Comcast. Uh, it's their job to discredit. I mean, you, went, you mentioned you were talking earlier about the Archie Bunker type. Well, those stereotypes are perpetuated for a reason, and they are stereotypes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the left people are always dis, uh, portrayed, although it's not true as kind of weak and wimpy and, uh, and, 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 and ideological. Yeah. And, uh, kind of clueless. And those are stereotypes and they, and the ruling elites perpetuate those stereotypes for a reason. This is what Gramsci writes about it is culture, cultural hegemony and the, ability to shape the cultural narrative is an important source of power. Uh, And that was why, as Glenn Ford understood, Barack Obama was so 
destructive to black radicalism. I remember speaking many times with Glenn uh, about how uh, up until Obama, uh, the uh, uh, black Americans probably had uh, certainly proportionately the best understanding of the evils of empire. Because, of course, empire is the external expression of white supremacy. And they uh, know quite intimately how white supremacy and institutional racism works. Uh, and Obama uh, was uh, quite a uh, powerful force in seducing uh, many within the black community to support uh, empire. It's interesting that August Wilson's last play, Radio Gulf, I don't know if you know it, is really about this Obama-like charismatic young black politician who does the interests of, he sets it in Pittsburgh, like most of his plays, who uh, mm -hmm. does the interests of the Pittsburgh real estate elite. Um, and that was Obama. Uh, and so you had figures like Cornell West, for instance, uh, who held fast to that black prophetic tradition. They were savaged, uh, and, and especially savaged within black media. Uh, which was complicit uh, with the uh, Obama administration. Uh, so those figures like Cornell, uh, who stood up publicly uh, to defend that black prophetic tradition were really crucified. Uh, and, and that was the power of, uh, you know, the corporate control of the media. Remember, Clinton deregulated the FCC, uh, mm -hmm. one of his many assaults against the American public and the American working class, along, of course, with the destruction of welfare. Um, and that consolidated corporate control in the hands of about a half dozen corporations who control about 90% of what Americans listen to or watch. Uh, and that has just narrowed the bandwidth of acceptable political debate. So uh, that, that, you know, there's that, those erasures of history. I mean, as black Americans, you are, should, are, I'm sure you're acutely aware of this, that the, uh, the, the ruling elites always attempt to erase or silence the history of those they have oppressed and replace it with another history. This, again, is a con Martin Luther King. Yeah, it's a con you know, well, you sanitize King. He becomes frozen and I have a dream, you know. And, uh, that, and Cornell published this great anthology called The Radical King mm -hmm. that essentially if he, you, nobody reads books anymore, that's another problem. Uh, he's, he's on the list of after you, okay. uh, Cornell is on the list. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the, the cultural news information uh, forces, which have been seized we, by a half dozen corporations, know what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, and this hasn't just affected uh, blacks in America, but it's affected whites. I mean, the whole idea that undocumented workers are responsible for your economic freefall is doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's... And not capitalism. Yeah, right. Yeah. First of all, there's only 11 million of them, and all of them are getting their wages <laughs> all their own. They have no rights. Yeah, but I mean, it... Uh, and, and this gets back to the of systems of information and education. Uh, so our, our real education, I mean, we had the bloodiest labor wars of any industrialized country. Hundreds, hundreds of American workers were murdered in the attempt to unionize. Uh, thousands were blacklisted, uh, uh, probably tens of thousands blacklisted, thousands wounded uh, by vigilante groups. We spoke about vigilante groups before, the Pinkertons, the, the gun thugs that were hired. Uh, and uh, there, there are reoccurring patterns and themes within American history. And those reoccurring patterns and themes in the hands of the ruling elite are meant to be silenced, which is why for those who actually want to understand their own past, where they come from, how they got there, you have to be immensely proactive. You're not going to get it probably off a screen uh, too much. Um, it's there, uh, but it's not taught and uh, it's not understood. And uh, that rootlessness is actually a term Anna Aaron uses, that rootlessness is quite effective in the hands of the ruling elite. Well, are they doubling down on that rootlessness that you speak of? Um, recently, I just heard uh, Christy Nome, the, uh, was she the governor of uh, South Dakota, wants to uh, eliminate teaching activism to children in schools. Did you see that, Pascal? No, but I did see that a governor of the state of Florida is trying to make it illegal to make white people feel guilty about history in 
uh, education in public schools. So the black teachers can't make them watch Roots anymore? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, the whole, I think this whole discourse, this culture wars centered around education is absurd on all fronts. But um, I'm not surprised by what you're telling me about the governor of South Dakota. It's a reimagining of America. Well, it's, it's, a, it's mythology. And uh, if you don't know where you came from, uh, then you have no ability to uh, self-critique or change. I mean, it, be, it becomes, I watched that, I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia. So with a breakdown of Yugoslavia had competing ethnic groups who retreated into their own mythologies about Serbs or Croats or Muslims, uh, and they couldn't even communicate with each other because none of them were speaking about a history grounded in verifiable fact. And that's exactly what's happening with the Christian right and this, Glenn Ford used to call it Trump's white man's party. Uh, so I was a few years ago down in Montgomery, Alabama with Brian Stevenson, and Brian was taking me through the city. Now, Montgomery, half of Montgomery is black. And there was just one Confederate memorial after another, including a gigantic Confederate flag that flies on the outskirts of Montgomery when you drive down from Birmingham. And Brian said, these things have all gone up in the last 10 years. And Brian, of course, has countered this with his markers to the victims of lynching. And, um, yes. uh, and I said, well, Brian, that's exactly what happened in Yugoslavia, that you strip people of their place within a society, those social bonds that give them meaning, a sense of purpose, uh, that, that project the possibility of a future. And, uh, and then they retreat. Uh, into these mythical identities because it's all they have left. Uh, so, and I see that happening and you see it especially within the media because the, the old media catered to the interests of the elites, um, uh, but didn't, uh, went out of its way not to uh, offend uh, one demographic or another. And it's the whole idea of objectivity and balance, which was a canard, but you know, was used by them. Uh, and now that's been replaced. Uh, and Matt Taibbi wrote a good book on this called Hate, Inc., with a picture of Rachel mm -hmm. Maddow on one side of the book and Sean Hannity on the other. Uh, and now you have media, media catering to a particular demographic and, and, uh, and telling that demographic what it wants to hear, but then also demonizing the opposing demographic and, and the quote unquote left or liberal media, MSNBC, CNN, The New York Times, Washington Post, are as guilty of this as the right-wing media. And that, of course, uh, mirrors what I watched in Yugoslavia as competing ethnic groups seized their own centers of uh, media control. And that's very, very dangerous because there's no ability to communicate. You constantly seek to stoke anger and rage. Uh, and you, and again, this is a parallel with Yugoslavia, you begin to speak in the language of violence, of assassinations, of taking people out, uh, and it's a very short step from there to actual violence. That's kind of the road we're on. I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, this might be you know, the, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, but you know, we're gonna get, we're gonna, I want to let you, uh, as they say in uh, hip-hop pop culture, freestyle with this, with this question. What is your assessment <laughs> of... Uh, the Bernie Sanders presidential run and its effect on American politics overall, comprehensively? I think Bernie's responsible for uh, emasculating the left. Uh, mm. First of all, I mean, I'm, Bernie has always uh, been a de facto member of the Democratic Party. He campaigned in 1996. This was after NAFTA, after the 1994 omnibus crime bill, I teach in a prison, I've taught in the New Jersey prison system through Rutgers University and their college credit program for uh, almost a decade. Uh, most of my students wouldn't be there, but for Clinton and Biden was a, was a driving force behind this bill. I'm very hard time forgiving them for this. I certainly can't vote for them. Um, uh, so Bernie, uh, this is the, the Democratic Party always allows an outlier, Kucinich or someone like Sanders, there with the full knowledge that the quid pro quo is that when they anoint their selected candidate, whether that's Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, uh, Bernie is going to then attempt to corral his supporters to back the Democrats. 
uh, and this is we're, we won't build a serious political movement in that election cycle. Uh, we certainly won't build it by uh, capitulating to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party have been full partners in the assault on the American working class and on the poor. Remember, 70 percent of the original recipients of welfare before Clinton destroyed the welfare system were children. Uh, and we just had the governor of Maine, uh, the legislature passed a bill allowing farm workers, it's an agricultural state, to unionize, and the Democratic governor killed it. Uh, so uh, Bernie, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think he's, I don't dislike him. I certainly voted for him in the primaries. I, uh, uh, I think he does care about the working class. Uh, but he does not want to jeopardize his own political position. He's not willing to defy the Democratic Party establishment. And that's not conjecture, because in 2014, I was in an event at New York City with Shama Sawant, the socialist city councilwoman uh, from Seattle. Uh, and Bernie was one of the speakers with us, uh, along with Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein. And uh and before the event, Shama was really pushing Bernie to run as an independent. And Bernie's response was, I don't want to end up like Ralph Nader. And I thought that was really telling. And I was a long supporter of Nader. I was Ralph's speechwriter. Uh, he understood that if he defied the Democratic Party establishment, he would be turned into a pariah like Ralph Nader. And it was a cost he wasn't willing to pay. And so therefore, I think Bernie is both politically and morally unfit at this point. Uh, to lead the kind of resistance that is imperative if we are going to wrest back uh, our very flawed, uh, but wrest back our democracy, uh, Bernie ain't going to do it. Well, this is the thing, and I, I, you know, I, I, you know, as you know, I'm a, I'm a mentee of both Bruce Dixon and Glenn Ford. Bruce, Glenn, Bruce Dixon, who was the original author of the Bernie Sanders is a sheepdog for the Democrats statement that comes from. Bruce Dixon, you know, God rest the soul of both of them. Uh, you don't think, and hear me out on this, that Bernie Sanders running publicly as a Democratic Socialist within the Democratic Party and capturing about 30 to 34 percent of the support within the Democratic Party, opening the political opening Overton window to where actually people are identifying with socialism as a political option having people talk about the legitimacy of policies like Medicare for all after people thought the Obama neoliberal uh, Obamacare was some kind of great, great uh, success story. Things like universal health care, things like, you know, universal public education, higher education at the university level. You don't think that the political dis discourse and ideolog ideological options that Americans considered even rhetorically legitimate because of the rise of his campaign. You don't find that to have been a net positive in terms of its effect on the American body politic? That is a net positive, uh, but uh, we have to acknowledge the Democratic Party will never give it to us. It, it's corporate controlled. Uh, and all you have to do is look at its major donors. Uh, so the Democratic Party freaked out uh, with Bernie's popularity in the primaries the second time around. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign was going nowhere. Uh, they reached out for a Republican replacement, Michael Bloomberg, that didn't go anywhere. And then Obama got on the phone and got everyone to drop out. Uh, so we got uh, Biden. Well, what's Biden done? Nothing. Uh, he, you know, I want to just uh, the minimum wage. He said everybody would get $2,000 checks. He, it's all crap. And, and look, look here, Jack. He said you get two checks. <laughs> I want to pivot to the, to the next question. And yeah, this might be my last because I know Jason wants to jump in here. In that regard, and you know, I want to let you freestyle on this one as well, Chris. We have a we have this 50 year counter 50 year plus counter revolution we talk about, where we have this bipartisan consensus, Democrat, Republican, but rooted in neoliberalism, which we we define as a hyper fancy word for corporate privatization. For, for those who don't understand what it is. Pretty much in the in the mind of the American consciousness, largely because of NAFTA and GATT, the Democrats were the worst stewards of the neoliberal turn or the hyper-corporate, hyper-privatization politics 
that brought us to this moment in the consciousness of many Americans. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to argue whether that's true or not, but particularly because of NAFTA and GATT, and also in the minds of many Black Americans because of mass incarceration and the Clinton crime bill, the stain of the neoliberal turn and the corporate turn in American politics has been levied more uh, adversely on Democrats. Usually when you say the word neoliberal in the consciousness of most people, they think Democrats and liberals now. Do, do you not think with the rhetoric and the posturing and the discourse in the Biden administration with things like the child tax credits, the bill back better, that, and I'm asking your, your, your thoughts, that the Democratic Party, though they may not be down with the Sanders agenda, because of the crisis of legitimacy they find themselves in, has no choice to either pivot to Keynesianism or social democracy or surrender to Trumpism without any option. They'll never pivot to Keynesianism because they've been bought and paid for. So what has Biden presided over? He's presided over the loss of extended unemployment benefits, rental assistance, forbearance of student loans, emergency checks, the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, and now the ending of the expansion of the child tax credits, all as the pandemic is surging. Uh, you have uh, the Americans who are uninsured or those who are covered by Medicare who are often frontline workers, they can't be reimbursed for over-the-counter COVID tests they buy. Um, no, but the, you know, uh, what a Glenn Ford used to say the Democrats aren't the least worst, they're mo the most effective worst. Or he may have said the most effective, most effective evil. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> and he's right. Evil. He's right. Mm -hmm. So it's rhetorical. I mean, you can get your corporate tyranny served up, uh, dished out to you by women and gays and people of color, or you can get it served out by, you know, neo-Confederate racists, but you're, you're going to you can't vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs and the American political system. It's impossible. So you don't, uh, believe, the, point, you don't believe the Democratic Party or any flank of American capital, the right flank or the left flank, is proposed. Is do you think that we are in a position where neoliberalism or the the move to hyper corporate American politics and capitalism has been so dilatorious that there is going to be a need to pivot away from it? Are you not you you do not believe that the pivot away from neoliberal capitalist American politics is happening in this current moment of crisis at all? I do, but but it's happening on the front line with frontline workers, not happening within the Democratic Party. The power of figures like Biden or Schumer or Pelosi is that they're the spigot. They they get all the money and then they dole it out. It's why they've domesticated AOC and the squad and everyone else. Uh, without that money, that dark money. Uh, they wouldn't hold political power, and they know it. Uh, and they're not going to give that up. They'd rather bring the whole thing down with them. Because even when they lose, you know, then they become lobbyists or they go to the Council on Foreign Relations and this kind of, they're all, the, the elites all take care of themselves. Uh, but it isn't going to come from the Democratic Party. I'm all for the overthrow of the corporate state. In fact, I think that's an imperative. Uh, but is it, is it going to, the Democratic oh, Party does not function as a political party. Oh, we're, we're agreeing with you. We're agreeing with you. We're just saying, do you think that there is going to be a slight pivot? That their Overton window, as they say, has shifted. No, he's pivoted. He's all, Biden's already pivoted to the right. He's pivoted to the right. because I mean, he's been that way since well, the Biden, look, Biden, late 70s. Yeah, Biden's, well, that's why he was selected. I mean, Biden has assiduously served, they used to call him Senator Credit Card. Uh, and yeah. by the way, the credit card companies, even back then, were employing his son, Hunter Biden, for staggering sums of money. I mean, uh, yeah, that's why he was selected. Uh, and, and they will fight over that narrow tranche of, you know, undecided, Trump voters, 80 million people in this country don't even vote. Uh, mm -hmm. But you never hear that number used. They just go after Jill Stein for, or Ralph Nader or somebody, which is ridiculous because nobody votes for Ralph, nobody voted for Jill. Um, uh, yeah, they've pivoted. They pivoted to the right. So you don't buy into the Joe Biden is the new FDR rhetoric? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's. I think more people people are actually running around saying that stuff. You know, I don't own a TV, so I insulate myself from this kind of crap.
Oh, that's you know what? We have your email now, so we'll just say I I do want to it's we're coming up on uh, on an hour and I do want to end on this note. You are constantly uh kind of maybe mischaracterized as the uh as the doom and gloom guy. You always have the predictions of of doom and gloom. And I w- I want to ask you uh this question. Um we we did a show some time ago with a gentleman named Michael Harris who wrote a book about Star Wars. I don't, I don't know if you remember the Star Wars movies. And uh, he uses Star Wars as a grand narrative for the left, kind of capturing what Lucas was originally talking about when he made Star Wars, that the uh, evil empire was the United States and the rebels were the Viet Cong. And uh, gets into... Um, all the politics that Lucas was trying to put into these movies that we didn't see and how Lucas was actually part of uh, the new left of the, of the late sixties. What is your message of hope for this young burgeoning left that we see here? I, I mean, for me, I mean, I read climate reports and I don't know how anyone can be particularly optimistic um, given the inability on the part of the ruling elites to respond in a rational way to the eco side. Um, uh, my message is that resistance is a moral imperative. And all great revolutionaries, Nelson Mandela, uh, Che, Che was a kind of mixed figure, but let's go with Che, Václav Havel, who I knew, uh, it didn't really matter whether you succeeded or not. Um, you stand with what the great theologian James Cohn used to call the crucified of the earth. I mean, I do in the end come out of this religious tradition and you have to be willing to pay the price. I mean, every time you want to go into a booth and vote for a Democrat, you should ask yourself, what would Malcolm X do? Uh, really? No, seriously. I mean, our, our two greatest prophets, contemporary prophets, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, were both deeply religious people. And they understood that there was a moral imperative that may even uh, end with a loss because they couldn't be bought. They wouldn't sell out. They wouldn't be quiet. And and the state knows what to do with prophets like that. It's what they did to Fred Hampton. They killed him. Uh, and, and King and, and Malcolm were acutely aware of that. And I think we have to find that kind of political courage to defy these forces of radical evil uh, and stop asking what's practical. Revolutionaries never ask what's practical. They ask what's right. Pascal, do you have any parting words or questions for uh Brother Hedges. Um, I, I wanted to say that I really appreciate uh, uh, Chris Hedges coming on our show and uh, laying down the gauntlet and uh, in terms of his uh, his position on the contemporary moment. Uh, I don't want you to get into prognostications because, uh, well, maybe you do. What do you see in the uh, immediate? Maybe you want to get into prognostications. What do you see in the immediate? I, I, will, I will say this, Pascal. In reading uh, America the Farewell Tour, there's like a couple paragraphs that I actually highlighted where he called out some of the stuff that we're talking about today in 2018. And the book came out probably 2017. Okay, well, let's, let's, you know, education gave me an opportunity. We're still in the moment we have global reactionary right wing, what some would call fascism, on the march all over the world. We have Viktor Orban in Hungary, who is now you know, expanding his consensus to other European countries. We have now this whole, we thought Marine Le Pen was the nightmare of reactionary right in France. Now we have someone even worse than her with Eric Zemmour. Uh, we, we have Boris Johnson, who is still uh, governing over Europe. Britain is basically now a right-wing one-party state. I have said that I think that America is going to move in that direction. Uh, you know, the global reactionary right in terms of the failure of neoliberal capitalism is ascendant. Do you think that the left flank of capital globally is defeated beyond the capacity to make post-World War II liberal democracy a factor anymore and that we're moving literally to a global reactionary right political reality? Probably, but it doesn't matter. We still have to resist. Uh, And that resistance allows us to assert ourselves as distinct individuals. It builds a community. Uh, with people who also embrace that moral imperative, and it tells those vulnerable, those people who are the most oppressed uh, and, and the most demonized, uh, whether that's Muslims or or blacks or anywhere, undocumented workers or anyone else, uh, that we stand with them. 
Uh, and uh, and that's that's our job. It's not our job to ask whether we're going to succeed or not. You go back and read the early moments of any revolution anywhere, and the odds are so stacked against the revolutionaries uh, that if they, uh, I mean, Lenin, six weeks before the Bolshevik, uh, well, it wasn't the Bolshevik, but before the Russian revolution that ended with the Bolshevik uh, rise to power, six weeks before gave a speech that said, those who are my age will not live to see the revolution. He was wrong. You can never tell uh, how history will play out. You can never tell uh, what we talked about earlier, what convergence of forces will come together uh, to trigger an uprising. Uh, and we have to be there. We have to be ready. We can't be passive. We can't be complicit because I'm going to go back to my religious roots. That's that's spiritual and probably intellectual death. I appreciate that. And I respect that, that answer. Uh, Chris Hedges, it's been an honor and a pleasure talking to you. I hope you uh, enjoyed your, your time with us at This Is Revolution great. podcast. Yeah. yeah, you guys are great. <laughs> I'll go back, well, I'll don't, go back don't, and listen to your other podcasts. Well, don't, don't hang up just yet. We've got to play the outro music, but don't hang up just yet. Thank you guys for watching the show. If you haven't done it already, please hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more programming like this. And also, we're going to try to convince Chris to hook us up with Cornell West so we can talk <laughs> to Cornell West. Because it's it's really hard these to get through to these people. If you only saw the amount of emails. Just to let you know, Chris, before we go, I want to say this on air. Joe Sacco even sent you a message for you to come on our show. Oh, I love Joe. Joe's a genius. He's a man. He is he's a he likes our show. Oh, Joe's great. So there you go. So don't hang up. And everybody, we are out. <laughs>